and there we go. Okay, uh, are we live? So I also had the NGD lecture two weeks ago and we had some internet problems back then. There were a lot of drop frames. I think the three was uh, stopping from time to time. And to fix that, <laughs> I had to get a new router over here. It was the case that the old router was in the position of, if we think of uh, my house here in Japan, which we just moved here recently. So the router was at position A1 and my computer is at T9. So it's uh, going throughout the whole house and there's a uh, vault, vault and everything in between. So I think that was causing a lot of interference. So anyway, I got a new router. It's got a few satellites. So this one should be at least for now, this seems to be working fine. Hi, everybody. You can still hear me? Well, if there's some problems later, we will just... Uh, I will probably put the camera off at that point. But uh, for now, we can go with this, it seems like. Hi, hi. Yeah. So, today's lecture, then. <laughs> I heard some people complaining already <laughs> that this was quite the clickbaity title. <laughs> what Go is really about. That's what we will talk about today. I can promise that the title is accurate, even if it's possibly not exactly what uh, some people are thinking it will be about. What Go is really about. So basically, if I list what we are going to talk about today, we are going to talk about... I'm going to describe my favorite way of uh, teaching the game to beginners, first of all. Uh, we are going to talk about some uh, end game practicalities with Chinese rules and I'm going to combine that with a uh, Go strategy to explain uh, how one kind of famous Japanese professional plays the game in a simple fashion <laughs> and I'm going to say that these are all connected and I'm going to try to do this in 75 minutes so that's going to be challenging as well but so we're going to talk uh, start with uh, talking about the way of teaching beginners. I, I think that's, well, it, it can be useful to many people also. Some people may think that it, it won't help them become better Go players, but I think that's probably also false. Like, uh, the way I'm going to explain this should be enough to give even stronger players a new angle about how to think about the game. So, to start with some discussion over here, Okay, I will ask you folks there. So, what do you think is the hardest part about teaching Go to beginners? Like, if you have tried teaching beginners, what what did you have trouble with? Or if you didn't teach any beginners, but... Uh, well, if you didn't teach beginners, you can still try to imagine that if you tried to explain it to beginners, uh, what would be the, the difficult point there? What do you think? I, I'm sure everybody has their own experiences. I have mine. Teaching them when the game ends. Mm-hmm. To total beginners, yes, the people who don't e even know the rules, basically. They might have a vague idea of what the game is about, but they don't know any practicalities. Keep their interest or motivate them to spend some time. Well, that's true as well, but let's assume that they have the motivation. Hardest part is making it fun. Mm -hmm. But usually if you have uh, several people who are all beginners and who are trying to learn together, in my experience, it becomes fun already with that. When the game ends and why you cannot play inside enemy territory. Well, life and death also, yes. Okay, but... To... Okay, I will, I will wait for a bit more <laughs> to get more people talking. Maybe there's some new ideas that I haven't heard, or new angles that I didn't consider. I need to give time for that as well. Oh, and it seems like uh, I put the board to the weird position. Okay, let's just uh, put it back there. That must have been confusing. <laughs> well, okay, it seems there's no more comments coming from now. So my vote also goes for when, when the game ends. Or I, I would uh, phrase it in the way that I think the hard part is in understanding what territory is, which is kind of a big issue because we always say that Go is about surrounding more territory, more territory than the opponent. And then 
when when the beginner asks what, what is territory or is this territory is that territory it's really difficult to explain all the steps that are, that are needed like the territory has to be fully enclosed right okay there may be the opponent's dead stones inside and for some reason you shouldn't care about those except that in some cases the territory has weaknesses and you can cut your way in or you can make an invading group right so so what exactly is territory i i would argue that if the players understand like uh, which parts of the board are territory and which are neutral intersections if, if they understand that then the end of the game is not going to be challenging my favorite i make a diagonal across the board whose territory is it diagonal across the board like uh one players so something like this hmm at least on this board size i think this would be all black territory <laughs> but maybe marcel meant something else ah okay yes this one yeah so this would uh, depend on the board size most likely and it's debatable like uh, if black is a weaker player and white is a stronger player, white might still be able to live here. Probably would be able to. Othello. Just play it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... My vote is basically on the game end. Uh, game end problem, but I, I would phrase it with the concept of territory. Like the Territory is a very high-level concept. Y you cannot explain it quickly with just a few words, because there, there's so many edge cases and uh, problem cases. So how I like to teach the game to total beginners is I don't use the word territory at all. Like Recently, in the past year or so, I have basically thought up a way of teaching the game that basically jumps past this uh, problem of having to explain territory. And uh, it has to do with... Um, rather, what do you say? Mm, it, it it's a way of teaching the game that some people have big big problems with and that other people think it's perfectly fine so i'm i'm talking about the stone capturing game right so how how many people here in the audience know what the stone capturing game is or i guess uh, some people call it atarigo as well i think atarigo is a bit weird because it's not just about atari it's about uh, capturing the stones so uh, stone capturing game Stone capturing game is also the it's a Japanese way of saying as well Ishitori game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so quite a quite a few people know it. <laughs> Don't tell Jizu Sensei. Yeah, 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 my teacher would would say that we need to start with the the actual territory surrounding game. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so I have had some children's classes. I have had some well. I don't know the numbers anymore. It's in the hundreds, possibly in the thousands of, uh, well, probably still hundreds of teaching new people. But uh, in in my experience, this works quite well. So we usually have a seven by seven by seven board. So this nine by nine over here is a little bit big. But I thought we can also look at this one and I explain. <laughs> You're not beginners after all. And so we start from this cross cut position, right? I got traumatized when I lost by capturing stones in the snap pack. Yeah, yeah. So there's a few different ways of uh, doing the stone capturing game. Like, uh, you you can first set a rule, like, or usually I set a rule that when the players start... Well, of course, I need to explain that surrounding captures a stone, right? Or that if you extend from a stone, then the stones uh, share their liberties. You need to explain what liberties are as well. So these empty intersections next to the stones, right? You're most likely all familiar with that. Anyway, so, so you explain that part, and then you can have the beginners play each other. And at the beginning, for example, it can just be simple that the, the player who first captures at least one stone wins a game. You, you want to have them play short, quick games, and then repeat so that they get the hang of it, right? About how to capture stones. And uh, you have them play one or two or three games like that, then you can increase the number. So instead of uh, one stone, it, it can be three stones. So whoever first captures at least three stones. So that will make for slightly longer games. And so the at the beginning, the results are going to look, look like something like this. So you explain that the goal is to capture the opponent's stones. So most people will go with this uh, 
Atari moves immediately, right? Okay, white has to extend, because if it's just one stone that uh, fixes the game, white has no choice about this. Black might play somewhere. Okay, white's hyper-aggressive as well. White's hyper-aggressive as well. Okay, so a strong player would see that uh, F4 and F8 would already be capturing, but these are beginners, so they will not see that one. Of course, at some point you can also explain ladders, little by little. Something like this might happen, white might uh, break out, something like this. Uh, black could still win with h7, but because they're beginners, they're going to make mistakes, right? And eventually something like this is going to happen. A and then white wins the game even though black had their chances as well, right? So first you can do with one stone, then you can do with three stones, then possibly with uh, five stones. Gradually when you do it, the beginners, uh, the beginners start to realize that if they go in, into parts of the board that had too many stones by the opponent, that they tend to get captured first. So they, they will get a little bit more defensive at some point, usually. So then they will start uh, maybe first extending. Extending. Well, this is relatively high level already, right? But like this, for example. And black might try to defend like this, like trying to stay conser conservative so that black is not purely on the offensive. H has to stay connected, right? And white's doing the same thing. This is a relatively high level beginner game. But uh, finally, we're going to get something like this, right? And uh, well, in this case, when black plays c9, black actually, we can say black wins the game if this is about one capture. Wait, that's not true, is it? Hmm? So what's this upper left corner? This is a Seki in the end? Because white can throw in, but this loses the game immediately. Okay, white can play here. Black could throw in, but white wins this game by capturing first. So with a two-space eye, basically both players are uncapturable, right? In this game. <laughs> so these kinds of things start to happen. It's just Seki. Or, uh, yeah, a two-space eye would be enough to live. But if this was for uh, three captures, then that would be different again. Uh, then it, in this case, would be a relatively normal one. White has to play here, black has to throw in, 1-1, one, one, uh, and the game would continue in that case. <laughs> Life and death is pretty perverse, yeah? But so basically like that. So then, once the beginners have played this enough so that... I, I mean, first of all, when you... Have the player when you have the beginners play the capturing game. First of all, they tend to be super aggressive, right? Because you have just explained that uh, the game is about capturing, so they go for the capture. But then, if you slightly comment the games in between, like ah oh, yeah, you went too far over there. If you go here, the opponent has more stones, so you will get captured first. So you should try to be a little bit more conservative. If if you do these kind of small comments between games, possibly comment one or two games in front of everybody then uh, gradually they will become passive players. Like, uh, they don't want to be captured first, so they make sure that uh, their stones get up this around it so easily. So once they get to that point, then you can make the final shift. Uh, which in this case is that you don't put any limit on the number of stones. Like, you just say that the player who captures more stones by the, uh, from the opponent wins the game. So then there's uh, no cutoff anymore, no... Seven stones is the limit, nine stones is the limit. It's just play until the end, whoever captures more stones wins the game. Simple. So the actual mind-blowing thing here is that this game is basically almost the same as real Go. This whoever captures more. In reality, there is one difference, one rule. One very small rule that could exist or could not exist. It doesn't strategically make such a big difference. If we add a small rule, then it's exactly the same as AGA, AGA rule game, or uh, French rules, or why not Chinese, for example. So actually, even though we say that Go is a territory surrounding game, we can just as well say that Go is a stone. Uh, Go is a game where you have to capture the opponent's stone. More of them. So most likely at this point, everybody is thinking uh, what kind of bullshit I'm saying over here, because uh, that's not what they have been taught. So 
I, I will show this with a different example. Okay, so here's a actual good 9x9 game. This is by... I just put moves inside Katago, basically. So this is Katago against Katago. And uh, there's a six and a half point coming in this game. Okay, so a little slightly complicated, but white lives on the upper side. Black has a single big group in the middle. I can see the link with Chinese rules. Yep. This, some end game here. Good technique with B1. That's a necessary defense. Like this. So if we are going by Japanese rules now, white's going to play here, right? And we basically say that this game is over. We, we, we play the dame, they don't change the score anymore. Uh, we count the score here. Uh, white has 11 points plus one capture, six and a half coming. So that's 18 and a half. Black has 17 points and one capture, so black has 18. So this would be a white win by half point by Japanese rules. And now, if we go backwards in history a little bit, so right now we play with uh, Japanese territorial rules, right? But we know that there's the Chinese area scoring as well, where you count both the surrounded territories and the living stones on the board, and that's it. And even before that, the, the way of counting was actually that you counted living stones on the board. So if we do this by the living stone counting, the players keep on adding stones inside their own territories. And after this point, white cannot do it anymore. Ah, uh, wait a second, there's <laughs> white played one too many in the lower, lower left corner. Yeah. That's more like it, right? Black plays, and now white cannot fill anywhere anymore, or white would get captured, right? So if we go with the old interpretation of the game, actually at this point, when white cannot fill anymore inside white's own territory, this would just be a white loss. Because clearly black's going to get to play more stones on the board. It's always black plays a stone, white plays a stone. So after white's turn, the number of played stones is going to be even, right? Which means that in this filling stage, if it turns out that one of the players cannot fill anymore and the other player can, then that means that player who can keep on filling has more territory. In this case, now we have a... Sounds like a more complicated game. No, this is a simpler game, actually. So back in the day, there wasn't Komi, of course. Now we have Komi. So if we want to adjust this for that one, uh, white would pass. This is one black more stone on the board. White passes is uh, one point for black. White has to pass again. And again. And again. Again. And I lost track, but I can keep on counting soon. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So white had to pass nine times more. White has six and a half commie, so that's going to come to a black win by two and a half points in that case. Should this scoring have some equivalent of commie? Uh, the stone scoring didn't have Komi at that time. We can adjust, but it's going to be a simple, uh, a slightly more uh, complicated way of adjusting it here. This is simply the ancient Chinese rules with group text. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Next you are going to tell me you should all play with in rules. No, 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 I'm not going to there. I, I like territory scoring. Territory scoring is very good. But the point is that I'm trying to explain where this game came from. Go. We have, we have the kind of... Easy to use Japanese territory rules now. Well, the Chinese rules are fine, good, fine as well. AGA rules, French rules, I like them all. But it used to be the case that, but we, we cannot know for sure, but uh, by Occam's razor, there is a super high probability that in the old days, Go was about who has more living stones on the board. We are talking about uh, 2000, maybe 2500 years ago.
and the point the reason for that is that we know from we have evidence that group tax existed a long time ago so in the stone scoring version we count only the living stones on the board right we don't count these empty intersections that the players cannot fill this is called the group tax so, so basically the white group at a the white group at b in order to leave they need to leave these intersections open so because white has no right to play at d8 white has no right to play at g9 we can in a sense argue that these don't belong to white they're not anything that are going to be white stones in the end so basically every living group you form on the board has to pay two points for its life in our way of understanding the territorial version of the game so that's group tax in this version of the game you want to have as few groups on the board as possible the more groups you create the more you have to pay tax for it so we have literal evidence uh, literature evidence of this one existing uh, we have something from 1500 years ago we have something from probably almost 2000 years ago as well and then at some point people people just uh, basically decided that uh, well g9 and d8 they look more white than black so how about we just uh, give them to the players anyway and let's just count the game more quickly just wondered why you wouldn't just build a living group and add stones every move if territory doesn't matter because you get because you get out of the moves earlier mm -hmm. You need to pass if you cannot play anymore. Mm. You need to pass if you cannot play anymore. So the opponent has more stones on the board in the end. Yeah, e exactly. Also in the old Chinese rules, there was also a clause that the players need to play the same number of moves on the board. So back in the day, white started the game because yin and yang, uh, yin is the dark one, young is the active one, active one is light, so active one, so, so white one should go first. In the old Chinese rules, by the old Chinese philosophy, white would play first in the game. Then after that we got some Japanese philosophy about... Uh, okay, so this is going to sound, sound extremely <laughs> racist, but uh, okay, this is all the Japanese traditional thinking, right? So white is pure and clean and good and everything, and black is... Uh, dirty and whatever. So so at, at some point the Japanese apparently decided that white is the better one. So uh, so then it, it, if you take white as the better one, then the stronger player should be white and clearly the weaker player should go first. So then uh, black would go first and uh, white would go second because white is better, right? <laughs> Sounds Japanese. A anyway, so the Japanese apparently flipped it around. Old Chinese ways, white goes first. But so anyway, in the old way, white would start the game, then black would play. And at the end of the game, the game would have to end on a black move. So that both players play the same number of moves. And that's nice, yin and yang, balance everything. Perfect. In French rules, white and black should play the same number of moves. I Ah, yes, and AGA also. In AGA rules and French rules, there's the this pass stone thing, right? So you, you can at any point pass your move, but you need to give a prisoner to the opponent. <laughs> but that's why black starts the game, the unpure starts the war. I guess... <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I would uh, advertise that interpretation, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> I guess. But yeah, so in the AG and French rules, it also has to end on white's turn. And if you pass, you give a point to the opponent captured stone so if black plays the last dummy then white will pass and pay one pay one point then black will pass and white has to pass one more time and to make up for this fact the commie is seven and a half points in those rules so actually it comes it finally comes to the if i remember right it, it comes back to the chinese scoring it gives the same result they can then count they can score the game as japanese game but it gives a Chinese result. So it's a very nice combination of the two. But yeah, so so far I just covered this uh, 
Livingstone interpretation, right? But so if we go with the past tone thing, oh, oh right, also because we are now doing the Chinese thing, or the in a sense we are counting area on the board. So I can actually optimize by not connecting the co, but by first playing a dummy here. So black plays dummy, white plays dummy. Black tries to fight the co, but white has more threats in this game, right? So finally in this game now white's going to win this co-fight and white's also going to get an extra intersection at g9. Th this makes a difference if we are counting area or if we are counting uh, living stones on the board. Not, not in Japanese scoring. So in the Japanese counting this would still be the same result. So now white has 9 points, white has 6 captures, white has 6.5 komi. That's uh, 20, 21.5 I think. Black has 16 points and 5 prisoners, so 21. So white still winning this game by half points. But so if we go with the number of living stones counting, we go until the end. So that's white 1 pass, 2 pass, 3 pass, 4, 5, 6 passes in the end. Ah, and a uh, seventh pass here, sorry, seven passes. So now with the group tax... Wait, uh, I, I think I'm counting something wrong. Okay, so we, we have the number of living stones here, that's easier. So 41 black and uh, 34 white. So black has seven more on the board, right? And it, even if white has six and a half komi, well, that means that black's going to be winning by half point in that case. White has 40 and a half and black would have 40, 41. 41, 34. Hmm? White by half? Should be black by half, right? Ah, oh, yeah, of course, if we did the Chinese way with 7.5, then it would be a white game. Mm -hmm. So now with the stone capturing way, then. So in the stone capturing way, if we just force white to have to play, or to give the um, pass stones to the opponent. White would play, play, and so white cap uh, black captures. So white has to give one prisoner. White has to give one more prisoner, and then the game ends. So in this case now, white would have one prisoner in this game. Uh, no, sorry, white gives one more prisoner here. So white will have altogether six prisoners and six and a half komi. And black will have 13 prisoners in this case. So this would still give the same uh, black half point win. But instead of counting the stones on the board, in this case we would be looking at what's on the what's in the captured stones cup. Which unfortunately, because I'm doing this lecture over here, I don't have any graphics to show you the stones uh, there in the cups. But they would agree with this with the result of the stone capturing. So if we just add the rule that you need to give up a stone when you pass, then it's going to make this, uh, it's going to make regular go, go into uh, capturing go, stone capturing game, with the only difference that there is this group tax, right? And the group tax can strategically make some difference, but uh, basically, uh, it's a conditional two, point, two points for every group you make. I think for most Go players now, at least because we don't have a long history of uh, people creating theory for how to play with group tax. After all, the Japanese uh, quit group tax pretty early. So if we try to adjust at this point, I think most people would generally still play in a relatively similar way, whether there was group tax or not. Because uh, basically, Usually, if one of the players has many groups, it tends to be that the other player has as well. So you can kind of uh, assume that you, usually the players have similar numbers of groups. And as long as you force the rule that the same number of moves needs to be played by black and white. Yeah, exactly. So that can be slightly different with Japanese rules. But again, uh, Chinese area scoring is basically adjusting 
uh, adjusting for that, or it auto automatic automatically becomes the same result with the uh, Chinese rules. As long as you force the rule. If, if we didn't force the rule, then it would be more like the Japanese result again. Eh? Okay, well, that's a bit complicated, but... Also for this endgame example, it's not exactly the point about how that uh, how those points are finally formed. But I hope that uh, this is pretty complicated after all. But in general, I hope this uh, example was somewhat enough to show that actually the games are the same. Like you, you can count in a few different ways, but they describe the same game. And actually, even the stone capturing game is still real go. <laughs> so just when you deal with beginners. And when you first get results like this, you, you just need to be you need to be prepared for the fact that this is just how beginners play. Because if you explain it's a capturing game, then they will be offensive, right? So you, that's just where you start to work from. Well, or in or in my case when I'm teaching. So first you let them uh, capture and get captured a little bit. Then you increase the number so that it's fine if you get captured with one stone, but uh, not three, for example. And so they will gradually become more defensive. And in the end, I think I didn't show the third example. So at some point, most likely they would be become able to play slightly more active moves. Like for example, h8 might be possible, because even though black might get captured with one stone, it uh, might not matter in the larger picture, because uh, this might also be cutting white. So th this is at the point when uh, you just count the total number of captures in the end, which, as we just covered, is actually just normal go with group tax. But so white might play like this defensively, like this. Both players might become conservative. And, well, finally it might start to look more like real go again. Not saying that beginners will quickly play like this, but... But I hope the general point is clear here. Getting captured with one stone twice will lose <laughs> second game. Cumulative. That's the first time I heard of that. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think I've written an NGD article about this as well. Like, if I had the... If I had the link... Okay, just a moment. I'm going to look it up. I think I can find it quickly. Because... Uh, the details can be a little bit difficult to understand. Like, my explanation here is a little bit complicated as well, and uh, you need time to actually understand what I'm uh, what I'm really trying to say here. But if you have time to think about it, it makes more sense. So, ah, uh, yeah, here it is. Yeah, so if, if you're interested in the actual details, uh, I've written an article here, so you can read that later. As for this lecture, now we can actually go to the actual go part about this, right? So, if we think about the game in terms of uh, whoever captures more stones wins the game, or conversely, who has more living stones on the board at the end of the game, then, uh, in my experience, it's hard for beginners to make that shift from offensive to defensive. That can be a problem, yes, and it's also different between players. I, I've seen beginners who are actually defensive from the start. And of course there's also beginners who never get defensive. But like, uh, for example, if you as a teacher are present there, and if you're making small nudges here and there, like you shouldn't try to review, you shouldn't try to review all of the games in detail all the time, right? That's not going to be fun. But you can give just a few tips each game. Or even just one tip per game. So if at that point you basically adjust that, ah yes, that was a little bit too aggressive, you went a little bit too far in, you should first defend this important stone here, then I think you can gradually make them a little bit more defensive. Yeah. And in my experience, I have actually seen that when the players start to realize that, okay, if I go in this, okay, if, if I go in this... Uh, black territory here, uh, let's not say territory, black area in the lower left corner, because black has more stones over there, it tends to be the case that white will just get captured in the end. 
like they, they might not understand it completely, but the, as a tendency, I, I've clearly seen that uh, they, they catch a kind of glimpse about it. At, at least some players do. Maybe not all, but uh, some players catch it, catch this very quickly. And when that happens, it, it's just basically that they stop making this kind of a uh, unnecessary invasion because. They, if they play in the lower left corner, they're just giving more capture to the opponent, right? And uh, that's more points to the opponent, so they just don't want to play there. So instead of that, they keep adding stones to the living groups they already have. They might play here, a black might play here. Uh, maybe you have explained the first line stuff, maybe they do this kind of thing. Uh, okay, maybe they play kind of dummy-like moves at some point. Maybe they play this here. Uh, maybe they try a little bit something. Oh, that's that could have worked, but let's let's say it fails like this. Then it goes like this, and then basically you just uh, make them play until the end. So they want to avoid getting captured as much as possible. They keep on f filling their own territories. And then at some point the players will basically be like, yeah, okay, I could play a little bit more inside my territory, but I'm not getting more captured stones here, right? And I don't want to give my opponent extra prisoners, so I'm not going to play there either. So then they're just going to be like, okay, let's finish here. Let's count the captures we have. Of course, if we did this actively, we should do it so that white has also played the last move. Yeah, so same number of moves, everything is fine. Or if one of the players says that, okay, we keep on doing it, then fine. So then white would have to give uh, one actual prisoner here, then black would pass, and that would be co completely accurate. But I think maybe with beginners you don't have to do it completely accurately by the point here. After all, when black captures this uh, six stones over here, I, I think white still doesn't have a single stone here, right? So the players would pretty quickly catch on that, okay, black's going to have more, right? So white wouldn't be entering the area in the first place, like this. This is still a zero capture game, right? So in this case now we need to enforce, if neither player has any captures, then we need to enforce the game ending. Uh, sorry, black doesn't play there. Here, here, here. And white has to keep on playing, so white has to play inside the black territory, or white has to give a pass stone, either way, right? So then it becomes clear that this is going to be a black win as well. And the actual point difference, if we play until the end, is actually going to be very close to a territory counting go, right? <laughs> well, that's just a general explanation there. But, so basically, how does territory then tie into all of this, right? What is Go really about, okay? We basically just showed that the Go can be about uh, having more stones on the board. So it, it can be, well, Go is about controlling more, more of the board than the opponent, right? Which, uh, depending on which way we count it, can be about who has more stones on the board, or we can also count who has more captures from the opponent if we enforce that players have to keep on playing stones, right? Or giving the pass stones. But so... Yeah, I'm doing this on 7x7 seven seven usually. It's generally about control. Yes, exactly. So when we get to this point, when we start thinking in terms of who has more stones on the board, then how does territory tie into it? I mean, of, of course, when we're talking with beginners, this is a way that we can avoid the term which I thought was a problem. So we don't need to say territory at all. We can just have them play stones on the board who has more wins. That's enough. And at some point they will uh, learn this... Uh, they will learn, learn this point that if you get to surround a big chunk, like this lower left corner, then that's actually going to give black a kind of an edge. Well, when they become strong enough, this happens, right? Whenever I teach beginners, we always get stuck at life and death stuff. That's also true, yes. And uh, most likely in that case, actually, the, the teacher shouldn't touch that part, I think. 
because if the teacher starts explaining com complicated stuff, well, that's usually not going to be fun to the beginners who, who don't even understand what's going on. So I think generally in that case, you just want to let the beginners play it out. Maybe after the game, you could show just one or two moves. Like maybe you could uh, vote like this instead and it could have been more interesting. But I think that's enough, usually. <laughs> and of course, uh, for that, you need to have two beginners, at least two beginners to play each other. Very tempting. It is very tempting to explain, I yes. At some point in the middle, I, I will explain one and two eyes, basically. At the point when they're playing the general game, like you count the total of capture stones in the end. Yeah, can't win the game if all your stones die. So usually when they go in that big main game, uh, this one, huh? Somewhere in between games, I will usually show a way that you can completely avoid your stones getting captured. That is a two eyes. And in, in my experience, that pretty quickly makes sense to the players. Like, it. You, you got the two eyes here. This. And white can... Okay, white can play at G9. Let's say suicide is okay. White can play at G9, but white gets captured. That's a one point to black. Or white can play at F8. Well, that also gets captured. Still one point to black. So, like, uh, th there's no way for white to touch this black group. So, you, you can basically explain that if a group has two separate surrounded intersections like this, then the group is safe. And usually, well, s some people might take a while to understand, but my, in my experience it works quite well. Uh, what was I saying before this? Ah, uh, yeah, so so we were... Uh, I was talking about the general uh, surrounding stuff, right? So the, the bigger chunk of a board you get to surround, the more it means that you will get extra stones there later in the game, right? That's basically what territory is about, right? So if you really wanted to explain it to a beginner, you would basically say that a player's territory is a part of the board that the opponent cannot get living stones in, right? If you really wanted to explain it. But you just don't need to explain it at all, because they will, they will kind of get it naturally in that if I enter there, I will get captured. That's more points to the opponent. Let's not do it <laughs> and avoid it. Oh, of course, it's going to get complicated uh, later on. But so once they start understanding in that way, then pretty quickly we actually see that the go is basically about surrounding things. It's about surrounding empty intersections, but in a way it's also about surrounding groups. Like... Uh, If we had this example over here, for example. So in one sense, we can see that this white group here is trying to surround the black group on the upper side. And if white can surround it tightly enough, then there's a good chance that white will get to capture the black, stone, black stones and uh, remove them from the border. Surrounding game, yeah? I also feel that it's kind of important that they understand who is... Uh, who is surrounding whom. Yeah, yeah. Because on the one hand, it's white surrounding the upper side black group here, right? And on the other hand, it's also this uh, these two black groups surrounding the white on the left side, which, as we saw in the earlier example, finally becomes a kind of capturing race here. And uh, if this is the simple capturing game where the first capture decides that this is something very weird, right? It's going to be a sticky in the end, but... Uh... But actually, I guess the groups are alive in that case. But yeah, so on, on the other hand, you can uh, surround empty intersections, and that's going to give you a profit later. Or you can surround the opponent's uh, groups immediately and try to capture, which is directly removing their stones from the board, right? So if you're counting captured stones, that's going to give you, give you more captures. Or if you're counting living stones instead, then that's... Uh, reducing the number of the opponent's living stones, right? <laughs> even at, even at single-digit queue, the surrounding is uh, confusing. Yep. Yeah, pretty much. But yeah, uh, so, so my main point until this was... Uh, well, my main point is that Go is about surrounding in the end. We, we don't need the territory concept. We just need the... 
need, need to be following what stones are going to live and who has more living stones on the board in the end. Mm -hmm. So it's about surrounding stones, but instead of going directly for your opponent's stone, you build those strong areas that capture... Yeah, yeah, that capture opponents easily if they enter. Yep. Yeah. That's... Uh, if we think in the simplest way, that's what territory is, right? Okay, let me switch the board now. Um, okay, this is going to take a bit of time. I do have a pro game for us to look at also. So, uh, this one here. Mm. Well, the right side coordinate is getting cut off a little. How can I adjust? Ah, okay. I know it's not bad. It's actually fine. And let's put this to the start as well. So if we just do something like a simple Joseph game, I guess nowadays 3-3 three, three innovation is good enough, right? So if we have something like this old Joseki from here, we say that the upper right corner is white territory, right? In, in, in a different sense, the upper right corner is also the white group's two eyes. So now it means that this white group is never in danger of getting captured anymore. And on the other hand, black cannot get living stones in these intersections. So at the end of the game, uh, white can... If you're doing the capturing game, or if you're doing the, the if you're counting living st living stones on the board, then white can build these intersections in the upper right corner, while black has to be filling somewhere else. So th th this is the uh, territory. This is something that can only belong to white in this game. It's a problem when in the teacher's mind all these concepts collapse in life and death puzzles. Yeah, the puzzles are interesting. Just don't need to do it too much, right? So we've been talking about surrounding for the whole lecture at this point. So I just thought I would uh, demonstrate to you a professional player who plays very straightforwardly a surrounding game. So which of you have heard about Omeyen? At least some of the audience here should be familiar with Omeyen, I think. He had a, I think he had Honimbo title like twice, probably. I, I'll write the name here as well. Oh, he had probably 2000, 2001, I think. Honimbo and uh, Oza in like 2003 or somewhere around there. In English, we have his, uh, well, there's Zone Press Park at least, which is uh, still basically about this surrounding thing. <laughs> The one of the sushi and beefsteak thing. <laughs> yeah, the zone press park has some uh, strategy, and then it has parts about the the other uh, drinking lots of alcohol and getting uh, sleeping it off or something. <laughs> Attack from the wider side. Mm -hmm. And Omien was also one of the first players. Uh, did he do it in this game as well? I, I think Omien was the player who first played this 016 enclosure actively. Like, it, this game is from 2007, but we see Omen playing this two-space high enclosure that uh, AI is clearly like. And Omen making the editor buy all this food. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that the editor got it from the publisher in the end. <laughs> publisher was the one who paid for it. Most likely as a way of writing the book, they would have this editor or the, or the writer of the book who would basically meet up with Omeyen and they would talk about uh, stuff and then the editor would tur turn those discussions into uh, theory books in the end. And apparently they did some two meetings at least in restaurants and, and then Omeyen would be drinking alcohol at the same time and so on. <laughs> or that's how the story goes anyway. But yeah, so Omeyen was one of the first players to play O16 actively. And maybe he did some other AI, AI-like stuff as well. Uh, so anyway, his way of playing is a very straightforwardly, let's surround something big. Okay, so if the opponent doesn't come inside, then fine, we make a huge framework. If the opponent does enter, makes an invasion, then okay, then we surround the, the invading group. Because even if the invader survives and lives inside, 
then that's still going to give you a wall that you can use in the rest of the game. And also maybe the opponent just gets captured. Okay, so let's just see here. And the opponent is Chochikun, by the way. Why is Chochikun? Ah, oh, that's kind of AI like as well, actually. So Chochikun starts living on the right side. Omein has uh, time enough to just play a normal cap here. Why is Chochikun? Uh, Chochikun live e everywhere, basically. Yeah, so these two players are actually kind of like polar opposites. Uh, Omein is the one who plays the surrounding framework uh, thick kind of game, and Chochikun is the one who takes early cash and is like, yeah, I'm going to live there, and there as well, and, and there as well. He, he doesn't die anywhere. <laughs> so if... Uh, technically, if in the game between these two players we had group hacks, that would make Omein's game a lot easier. Or it would fit Omein's style much better. Black starts surrounding. Chochikun is fine with living on the upper side. Okay, we have some fancy Tetsuji stuff over here. But so, essentially, in the end, white's on the upper side. Okay, white captured a few black stones. Black got a corner, black got a wall with a kind of weakness there. Chochikun wrote a book in Japanese where he asserts that taking territory is thick. Now, that's it, actually, isn't it? Okay, sorry, I will just go back a little bit. Taking territory is thick. If you have this upper right corner, group, you're never going to get in trouble anymore. When you form territory with your groups, you're making it totally strong so that it cannot be attacked anymore. The opponent has no forcing moves against you. When the opponent has no forcing moves on you, that means your position is thick. So in a sense, we can say that this white group is thicker than this black group on the outside, because this black group can be threatened with, for example, this uh, white peep over here. So it's like there's uh, this kind of vague potential against the black group, but not so much against white. If black gets to play... A... Wait a second. If black gets to play a turn here, then it basically means that black's going to get this descent here in center, which is a little bit not thick for white. But that's only after black has the turn here. Turn is still not forcing. So, white's definitely the thicker one here. So, in a sense, the Chochikun logic here is that if you have a weak group, you want to make territory with it. So that way, it will prevent the opponent from attacking, and on the other hand, you're also getting something that's uh, worth something at the end of the game. So this result here on the upper side, this is very much like Chochikun. Make territory with your weak groups. And now black has nothing on the up, on, on the white group on the upper side anymore. So black goes for the right side group. White defends. White is Chochikun, white will just live. Okay. Because black became strong on the right side as well, black gets these forcing moves. Uh, white is Chochikun, he will just live by getting a little bit of territory here. <laughs> okay. And the next group. Black goes from the outside. Like this. And white attaches. White's barely going to live on the right side as well. That's going to be like a six point life, finally, I think. And the lower right corner is also going to become like a six point life. So this white play is very much Chochikun. This black play with the center wall, that still doesn't clearly surround anything. But this is clearly the Omeyan style here. Let's mark this up well. And now, well, if we are going to show this kind of a game, and if we are going to show white playing Chochikun and black doing some cloudy stuff like this that you cannot see the clear value of, I also made the check that if black played thickly here, I think in the game black did something more severe and that kind of backfired. So finally, 
White not only lived on the right side, but White could also create several weaknesses for Black in the center. So th this was something that didn't go well for Black. And basically because of these factors, Chochikun did win this game. But earlier when White played this one, if Black simply connected here in the center, and the white right side group is alive, so I think it was correct for white to start erasing the center with something like this. So if this happened, this would have been an even game, according to Katago. Or I think black may have been actually even a little bit better, because for some reason Katago really likes this A connection, and the wall that flows from here, uh, follows from there. So this is basically to say that I guess it's best to look at this position here. So, when we think about the way of playing here, the way of playing for white and for black, I'm pretty sure that black's way is a lot easier. Because white has to be certain at all times that the, that the white groups are going to survive. White needs to get two eyes for the groups, but if white only gets two eyes, then, especially if there was group tax, but even if there wasn't group tax, you're... you're still not really getting territory. So you usually want to make your groups live by while also getting some territory in the process. And that's kind of difficult to do efficiently. Okay, Cho Chikun is strong. Cho Chikun can pull it off with his reading. But if he makes a mistake, he might just die. And he, he makes mistakes sometimes. For black, black is just surrounding. But black is kind of like a drawing pictures on the board, staying connected. Especially if black does like this, black has no weaknesses, and it's still efficient against one of the strongest players in the world. <laughs> this is great style to play as black, it can feel very casual. Yeah, like, black has no worries, right? Bl black can uh, kind of try to develop a feeling for, ah, what is big on the board, or, okay, let's uh, threaten white a little bit over here, and then go to this part of the board. <laughs> Hanami go. <laughs> And uh, yeah, white is the one who is sweating. White is the one who has to make sure that, okay, this group has two eyes, this group has two eyes. They're also getting some territory, but is the territory good enough? Mm, let's try to adjust. Okay, optimize for territory. <laughs> Baduk Doctor calls this living naturally or capturing naturally. Hmm. I would feel uncomfortable as black, because I would be thinking that at some point something has to become territory. Playing like this black online lowdown ranks feels like cheat code. <laughs> kind of cheat code, yes. Because at some point the opponent will usually invade and they cannot invade too deeply, right? Opponent just falls apart on their own. You don't have to do anything. Kind of true, actually, yes. Especially if there is a time limit. Uh, this kind of a game clearly favors black by a lot. Because whenever there is a fight, uh, you, you basically need to start, you need to go into reading mode in that case, right? And uh, the less time there is, the worse your reading will be, the more you will make errors. If you're white in this game, if you're on the defensive and you have to make your group live, if you make a critical error, then your group is going to die and you lose the game. Whereas if you're black and if you make an error, maybe white lived with too much territory. That's not... Uh, that's not a 30-point mistake, that's more like a 5-point mistake in that case. So that's something that you can still recover from. And that's something that's one-sidedly in Black's favor in this kind of a game. So especially if there's limited time, you want to play like Black here. Make the thick shapes, make sure that yeah, your group's alive, connected, and then something will work out eventually. <laughs> but playing Black is hard in those games, and at some point you start to feel pressure of making enough territory. That can happen, yes. If white does the leading part efficiently, if you never actually get to threaten white anywhere, and if you also don't have territorial potential, then you can get in trouble. But for example, if you can get to form a shape like this one in this game, I think this black is not in trouble, right? Uh, let me mark this off. Because black has this huge wall that's all connected against the center. It's becoming a box-like shape that only has one side open. So it's starting to turn into something that can be finished and turned into a box of territory. Mm. 
strength increases, weakness decreases. Ah, yeah, the, the stronger your position is, the more territory you will get with it eventually. It basically means that the end game is going to favor you. Because, for example, on the upper side, the white shape has some weakness with the L18 stone. I relate to them. Like, for example, this black move is going to be a center. It threatens to connect here. So because of the weakness of the white shape, white will probably need to play this kind of a move. So finally the territory is going to look smaller than it may appear. And okay, white might have a chance to play here, but if black plays here, black's actually going to threaten to capture a good part of the white group. So this is going to be black's privilege. Mm. What should what would be white's most escape in this inst escape? Um, okay, not sure I understand escape here, but basically this game is now going to be about the center. So white white's next job is to make sure that black wouldn't get too much here in this center. Yeah, okay, so that was actually one topic that uh, I was also supposed to talk about here. So like, um, okay, we were looking at the nine by nine board at the beginning. So in a 9x9 nine nine game, you usually cannot get more than two living groups, and even that can be difficult. In a typical 9x9 nine nine game, maybe it's just one group and one group, but a 2-1 is also possible. Now, in a 19x19 nineteen nineteen game, we've got this proverb that uh, if you have six groups on the board, then one of them is dead. I think that's a good proverb for this kind of a game. So... Uh, um, we can count white groups here. One, two, three, four, five at this point, right? Well, technically white might get to uh, connect his groups on the left side later in the game, but for now they can still, uh, for now they're still separate, I think. So white's at five groups. Black is basically the one huge A group, which can maybe technically be cut by something like white B, but that's also conditional. So Black has like one and a half groups, maybe. So black's fine, and white's definitely on the busier side. So for example, if this was your average uh, lowdown game online, white would be looking at this uh, center that seems like it would be becoming a big black territory with just like one black move like this, right? It would become kind of difficult for white to enter. And well, soon we can see this kind of a box, right? So white would be looking at the, the center, figuring it's important. White might throw a stone somewhere around here. And, well, now black has several different ways black can play here, but the, for a very straightforward way, black can just start cutting here. Black can look at white A and B and C, and black can just decide to separate all of these from each other. So white might jump here. Okay, we jump. Jump here. Okay, I'm going to peep here just to enforce the cut, like this, like this. And if we get this point, now white's at six groups, right? Now, strictly speaking, I think, well, okay, there is actually a good chance that when black starts attacking after this, that one of these white groups will just die, like this kind of thing, right? It's not so easy for white to get two eyes. And if white lives, then black does this one next. White has to make the corner survive as well. Okay, that survives as well. Uh, let's play some forcing moves here. Okay, that was ours as well. Uh, there might be something like this, but white can live, I guess. Well, okay, but let's exchange that as well. And if we play all of these forcing moves, white finally barely lives. It's usually going to be the case that black wins this game on territory anyway, even if white manages to survive. Like, there was a good risk that white might just be dying in the center. Okay, white played properly, white lived, but it's four points for white in the center, six in the right side, six in the lower right corner, uh, about eight in the on the upper side, some eight in the lower left corner. It's black's turn to play something like C12 or, uh, well, maybe like here. So there's still a very high probability that white wasn't efficient 
in uh, making the groups live there. But if he tried harder, if he tried like this, for example, it might be that the group would be just dying. Well, assuming that black can pull this off, of course. If black cannot, then black will just play a little bit more conservatively. We can still get the territory from there. So the point is that if you have too many groups you need to look after, then that means you're going to have less time worrying about territory and uh, making your moves efficient in terms of the whole board. The, the time you spend uh, getting those two eyes is time that you're not uh, influencing the whole board or uh, surrounding bigger chunks of territory. So that's just one very good way of uh, playing this kind of a game. It basically means that when you have this kind of a strong position, like we can also think that the black way of playing here is that with these walls, uh, with these two walls here, also the lower right corner actually, black has walled off three white groups from the center. There are three separate groups. Those white groups will not help any further white groups live in the center. And so now the only access that white has into the center is from the left side. Like, uh, if white wants to play in a connected way to make sure that his stones don't get into trouble, like we talked about a little bit with a, with a beginner practice, then white has to play something more like this, right? And something more like this, and like this, in a more conservative way of playing. So it basically means that the, the fact that black has this strong position here in the center, it directly affects what white can do in this game. White cannot freely choose to play a stone in the center to just reduce, even though it would be big, because that means that white could get under under attack and uh, get into a difficult defensive position. So because black is strong, white is forced to play in a more conservative way, which means that, uh, well, black on the other hand can be more free, because black has nothing to worry about. Black has no weaknesses. If it was black's turn, black could easily just create a new group. If white tried to attack, we play a few jumps in the center and not only is black escaping, black is also making territory in the upper center. So this kind of a strong position basically buys you freedom. So even if you don't see the profit that you're going to be getting from it, there's going to be some. It's just invisible at this point of the game, but you're going to, generally speaking, you're going to profit from it. Okay, now we're at 10 past 8. Yeah, so that's actually already the main message of the lecture here. So, as somebody in the chat also said it, Go is surrounding game in uh, many different senses of the, word, of the word, of the term. Of course, it's about, uh, so we already covered it. it. It's about getting more living stones on the board, right? Or it, it can be about who captures more of the opponent's stones if we force the players to have to continue playing stones by the pass rule, right? So strictly speaking, it's about who has more stones, but uh, strategically it actually means this, uh, it, it turns into this whole surrounding thing. You want to surround the empty intersections because it means that the opponent cannot get leading stones inside. And on the other hand, because the groups need to surround two eyes for themselves, just to live. It means that when you start surrounding the opponent's group, it will strategically force them into forming those eyes. And that's going to be some effort that they, they cannot use for something more, more useful, like uh, playing in larger parts of the board. Does that make sense? <laughs> Most likely the, the end game examples were a little bit difficult to explain, finally. Uh, for that one, I guess the article that I linked earlier should be good if, if people are interested in that part. So I'll just link it again here. And besides that, well, actually, so this link behind here also explains, I think this was the one, Guide. Oh, wait, this is not the guide. Oh, just one moment. I, I think there may have been a guide as well. Ah, um... oh, yes, yes, yes. Mm. 
No, probably it's just this this link I just wrote here. But yeah, so if, if there's any people here following this lecture that are thinking about or that have opportunities to teach new players, I would strongly suggest this way. I, in, instead of going directly with uh, go as a territory surrounding game and how exactly you should surround territory and what territory is about, I would strongly suggest against uh, against uh, that or well. <laughs> How to say it? Like, if you start with explaining territory, that's already a high-level concept. So that's not going to make it very easy for the for the beginners to understand. So you should definitely start with something easier. So I, I think living stones is most likely the easier approach there. Of course, you can do it with the capturing way as well. But I, I think the transition from uh, capturing more stones to having more living stones is already kind of a natural. So you, you can start with the capturing game and then flip it around into who has more living stones. And it's it's logical enough in my opinion. Most likely Well, I, I've been thinking about it a little bit, but most likely I should try to write an actual guide, maybe in book form, that explains this in detail. C could be helpful to for for getting more players to start the game. Can I ask something off topic? Does your level 1p include 9x9 size boards? Are you stronger or weaker than 1p and 9x9? Uh, good question. <laughs> I think I've played relatively more 9x9 games than most pros. I, I play in GoQuest quite often, but my reading is worse. It, it might average out. Not sure. It's fun how the seemingly simple question of what is this game about that any beginner can ask ends up as this complex topic with history and philosophy, philosophy involved. Well, this lecture in particle was not for beginners, right? This was for people who are already pretty good at the game and who might be teaching the game to new beginners, right? <laughs> so I thought it would just be interesting to mash in some uh, history as well, where the game came from. Seemingly simple question. What is this game about? Like, wasn't there also this anecdote that somebody asked Fujisawa Shuko, uh, honorary Kisei, how much he thought he understood about Go? And he, he said something like 14%, I think. Like, uh, of all the knowledge that there is to learn about Go, he thought he understood, like, uh, maybe 14%. As a player of, I think he was, like, 70 70 years old at the time. <laughs> so what is this game about is a difficult question. <laughs> yeah, okay, so uh, the lecture is about to finish here. So if you have any questions or comments or so on, uh, now would be a good time. A anything goes. It can be about the content we just saw so far, but it can be something, something else as well. Ah, interested to try teaching this way. That's good. Uh, if you do try, do also tell me how it worked out finally. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Mm -mm. Explaining by Chinese rules does make the concept more graspable. That is true, yes. How do you play this tile with white? How do you play this tile as... This style with, with white is kind of difficult because it, it's basically about... Okay, well, this could turn into a long answer. I'll try to cut it a little bit shorter, right? There's not too much time. But I think that basically the trick is in deciding early where you want to have your groups, finally speaking. Like, the, the rule about not having six groups on the board actually is kind of efficient here. So we should limit ourselves to making five groups on the board at the most. So if you can only have five five groups, then basically if you play territory from the beginning, then you need to decide where you're going to have those groups in the end, right? And already at this point, when white decides to help the upper side group, it means that white has five, right? 
So th this is basically now restricting White's uh, future strategical options, or like White has fewer directions to think about. So White's going to be playing on the upper side, on the right side, lower right corner. But it, it basically means that White's not going to be getting a new group in the center anymore. And that's something that White's already deciding here. Well, if White gets a connect on the left side, then it count, the count goes down. But in principle, this is the kind of reading, uh, uh, the kind of thinking. So if White didn't like that, uh, now it's four groups at this point. So in a sense, White playing on the upper side is an investment, because that's going to be the last group White can make in this game if Black starts attacking, right? So if White didn't like that, then for the time being, White might be just, uh, for example, strengthening the right side group, add adding stones to it, like this, going from here, walls off. Well, okay, if that group is strong enough now, well, actually, I think we might start fighting from here in that case. I cannot do like this. Maybe Black at this point would be doing something else. Black might be connecting here. Then we might still jump out if we want to be playing solidly. Or if we think that the groups are strong enough, then now you can start creating a new group in that case. But So it's basically... You need to look after your groups on the board that they become strong enough that uh, you don't really need to... Like, the opponent has fewer ways to attack them, basically. You need to reduce the amount of control that the opponent has on you. I, I guess that's a way to think about it. And usually in 19 by 19 it means that you cannot have too many groups. Usually 5 is the limit. Fewer ways to attack, yes. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. This game is about writing philosophy theses. The fact that the game is just a byproduct. <laughs> Pretty much yes. <laughs> Alright. Uh, seems like that's the end of the question. So, yeah. Thanks for watching. And next lecture is going to be in three weeks now. We are going to have a one-week break in between. Okay. So see you then. Have a nice day.